Welcome back. It's now time for our second presentation, Sales and Use Tax for Construction. Thank you, Leah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second presentation of today's OVTA. The second presentation is about construction, construction contractor sales and use tax issues. My name is Ryan Sable. I'm an attorney with the Ohio Department of Taxation's Office of Chief Counsel. And I'm joined by my co-presenter today, Mr. Brian Summers. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Ryan. Um, my name is Brian Summer. I am a sales and use tax auditor uh, in the audit division. Happy to have you here with me. Um, first, we'll go over today's agenda. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the first three bullet points you see there. Uh, first, we'll go over some Ohio revised code and uh, some important definitions found in the code. And essentially, what we're going to be talking today is hinges a lot on real property versus tangible personal property. From there, we'll talk about some relevant case law in this area. And then I'll move on into exemptions, where to find those in the code and the administrative code and uh, some details about those. Then I'll hand it over to Brian. He's going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about some of the highlights of what I talk about and uh, give you a more uh, pra pragmatic uh, view of that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're going to talk about some examples of business fixtures and some of the differences between real property and business fixtures. Um, we're also going to go over the contract decertification process and exactly what it is and when you would use it and what kind of what types of situations you would need to get that as a contractor. Uh, next, we're going to go over some common exemption forms uh, that contractors would typically use. Uh, there's two common ones, the STEC-CC and the STEC-CO. So we're going to look, in, look at those in depth, um, make sure that as a contractor you're getting everything you need. Uh, then we're going to move on to talking about the taxability of tools and equipment. And items consumed or used in the construction process. And then finally, we're going to wrap up talking about um, licensing requirements as a contractor. So what types of licenses you would need to have to, to comply with all your, your sales and use tax obligations? Sounds great. Um, like the commissioner said, this is a pretty complicated uh, area of the tax law. So this is going to be more of an overview presentation. Uh, we hope we uh, find it helpful and informative and spark some further questions and research that you can do and you can ask us those questions throughout the presentation. So before we start into the actual topic of construction contracts with sales and use tax, I wanted to give us a foundation of the sales and use tax just in general. So today we're going to be talking about real property a lot and so it's easy to kind of get confused like maybe we're talking about property tax but that's not the case. We're only talking about sales and use tax. So most people are common with the uh, familiar with the, uh, the sales tax. It's just it's a tax that's levied upon the certain sale of products, merchandise, and services. Um, so a basic example is you go to a store, you buy a shirt, pay tax on it, that's sales tax. Um, the less common uh, that thing people are less familiar with is the use tax. And it's just a, essentially a companion tax to the sales tax. The use tax is a tax upon purchases and the use of certain items and services within the state where no original sales tax has been collected. You'll notice that the use the tax rate is always going to be the same in every county as the sales tax in that county. And every state that has a sales tax also has a companion use tax. So with that foundation, we move into today's topic, construction contracts. And first, we're going to look at Ohio Revised Code 5739.01. And 5739.01 is generally written so that sales are presumed to be taxable. From there, it goes on to state certain sales that aren't taxable and create certain exemptions. And what we're going to look at today when we talk about construction contracts is Revised Code 5739.01b5, which states that a sale does not include a construction contract in which tangible personal property is incorporated into a structure or improvement on and becoming real, real property. So if you have a piece of tangible personal property, let's say lumber or wood, and you incorporate that into a structure, you build a house, that house is real property, so that the wood that you incorporated into that real property is not a taxable sale to the contractee. 5739.01b5 then goes on to state that the, con the construction contractor is then the consumer of that tangible personal property incorporated into the realty. So when the contractor goes out to buy the lumber for 
building the house, they're charged tax on the purchase of that lumber. So we're going to dive into some of the, the definitions in more depth here. Uh, real property is defined in Revised Code 570102 as land, and unless otherwise specified, buildings, structures, improvements, and fixtures on the land. And I just want to point out that language there, otherwise specified, that's going to be really important, and we'll talk about that in more detail later, but I just want to point that out now that, that that's going to be important. We also are going to be dealing a lot with tangible personal property, and that's defined in Revised Code 570103, and there's a two-part definition there. The first part is general 570103A. It says that every tangible thing that is the subject of ownership and is not real property is tangible personal property. Tangible personal property can also be a business fixture, and that's defined in 570103B, the second part of the tangible personal property definition. And business fixture is defined in 570103B as an item of tangible personal property that is permanently affixed to realty that primarily benefits the business conducted on the premises and not the realty. So that last portion there, the primarily benefits the business conducted, that's going to be really important because a lot of what we talk about with business fixtures versus real property, business fixture and real property look and sound a lot alike. So the important determination there, whether something is real property or whether it's tangible personal property as a business fixture, is going to come down to that test in the definition of business fixture as primarily benefits the business conducted on the premises and not the realty. So why is this important? We're going to remind you throughout the presentation, because this is essentially the crux of what's going on with this area of law, is the, the determination between whether something is real property or whether it's tangible personal property is going to determine who pays the tax and what the tax base is going to be. So you can see on the slide here, if you're dealing with real property, the contractor is going to pay the tax on, the, on, that, uh, on that property as the consumer. And the contractor is going to pay that tax at a tax base of the material or the produced cost. If you contrast that with tangible personal property, the contract E is going to pay the tax as the consumer in that case. And the contract E is going to pay that tax at a tax base of the price that includes the material cost, but also includes the labor and installation costs um, added by the contractor. So like I said, we're going to remind you of this throughout the presentation, but this is a really important determination. We've reached our first test your knowledge question. OK. This is, this is fairly basic. Are you ready, Brian? I'm ready. All right. Question. The contractor builds a new house for contract E. Which party is responsible for paying the tax on the materials purchased to build the house? What do you think? Um, well, I guess a house is going to be typically considered real property. So kind of what you said on the last slide, the, the contractor is going to be consider, considered the consumer. So um, my guess is going to be the contractor has to pay the tax on, on all those materials. Is that correct? Sounds like more than a guess. It sounds like you're okay. correct. Well, yeah. Okay. And you are. The contractor is going to be responsible for paying tax on that material. The house is real property, as you said. And therefore, because the material purchased is incorporated into that house and sold as real property to the contractee, the contractor is going to be the consumer who pays the tax on that material in accordance with 5739.01b5. Bravo, Brian. And like I mentioned, we're going to remind you of this a lot throughout the presentation, but this determination of whether something is real property versus tangible personal property is really important. It's going to determine who pays the tax, what the tax base is going to be for, the, for calculating the tax owed, and if you're the construction contractor, it's going to determine the accuracy of your bids and your budgeting process. So something as a contractor you're going to really want to pay attention to. Um, before we move on to case law, I thought it would be important to go over a list of things that are never considered construction contracts, and then also a list of things that are commonly considered business fixtures. So we'll get to that on the next slide. But for now, this slide, items never considered as a construction contract under Revised Code 5739.01b5, and this is also found in Ohio Administrative Code 5703.914c. So these things include carpeting, landscaping and lawn care services, agricultural land tile, and grain bins. And I want to point out 
when you're looking at carpeting, notice that there's no other type of flooring listed there. So laminate, vinyl, hardwood, all of that is going to be considered incorporated into the real property under the construction contract, but carpeting is not. So carpeting is always going to be taxable to the contract. Now here's the list of uh, examples of items that are commonly treated as business fixture. And you'll remember a business fixture, the, the primary test to determine whether something is a business fixture instead of real property is whether it primarily benefits the business conducted on the premises. Um, and so these things have been determined to primarily benefit the business rather than the realty. The gas station canopies, security cameras that protect in inventory of interior rooms, HVAC and flooring for computer rooms, special lighting, parking lot lighting at car dealerships, window treatments, and specialty cabinetry. You've reached another test your knowledge question. Ready for round two? Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> All right. A business contractee asks its contractor to install a handicap ramp on the premises. Is the handicap ramp a business fixture? What do you think, Brian? Uh, well, I think a handicap ramp seems like it's a specialized type of, of item. Um, but if you think about it, you, you kind of see handicap ramps in, in a lot of public places like stores uh, and public buildings. And I would think that's something that's going to be common to buildings. So I'm thinking it's probably going to be classified as real property and not a business fixture. Oh, I like your reasoning. Okay. Yes, you are correct. No, a handicap ramp is never a business fixture. The handicap ramp is not specialized to the particular business and it's not for the primary benefit of that business, and therefore it's not a business fixture, it's real property. Um, and a good way to think about this is, as Brian was alluding to, if you've got something and you're trying to determine whether it's real property versus a business fixture, one way to test whether it's going to be real property versus a business fixture is to think of it, if you moved whatever business was there and put a new business in that same spot with those, those same fixtures and structures, would those structures, fixtures, be useful to the new business coming in? So, for example, if you had a Wendy's, they have a, uh, sorry, a handicap ramp at the Wendy's. If you move that Wendy's out of that location and you put an accounting firm in there, that handicap ramp is still going to serve a purpose to that new accounting firm. So it's, it's not a business fixture. It wasn't specialized to that Wendy's. All right, now we're going to move into case law. And the first case I want to talk about is um, a Supreme Court of Ohio case, Funtime Incorporated versus Wilkins. And this is the case where I said we'd be talking about the otherwise specified portion of the uh, real property def definition in 5701.02. Uh, the court analyzed um, that definition, and they stated that first, when you're looking at the definition of real property under 5701.02, you have to see, okay, does the item meet the definition of real property? If it does, you then move forward and see if it's otherwise spe uh, specified as tangible personal property under revised code 5701.03, which, as we talked about, includes the business fixture definition. So in that case, the contractee was trying to say that they were dealing with real property, and therefore it was taxable to the contractor and not them. The court said, yeah, it looks like it meets the definition of real property, but it's actually a business fixture. It's otherwise specified as a business fixture under 5701.03. Uh, we'll move down to Newcomb Electric Systems versus Tracy. That's a Ohio Board of Tax Appeals case. In that case, the Board of Tax Appeals found that data cabling was a business fixture because it primarily benefited that business. Next, we look at FP&E Incorporated versus Tracy, another Board of Tax Appeals case. In this case, the Board of Tax Appeals found that the gas station canopies were considered business fixtures. And then finally, Oregon Ford Incorporated versus Wilkins, another Board of Tax Appeals case. The Board of Tax Appeals in this case found that parking lot lighting used to illuminate inventory at a car dealership was a business fixture. And so we kind of we mention these cases, and we give you the, the citation there. Um, so you can, you can go look them up and look at the court's reasoning in more in depth if, if you want. And uh, if, you're, if you're struggling with maybe, I don't know if something's real property versus whether it's a business fixture, you can look at one of these cases or another case that's out there that's similar to what you're dealing with and look at the court's reasoning in helping making your decision. 
So now we'll move into exemptions. Uh, the first exemption that I want to talk about is revised code 573902B13. And here the code provides an exemption for building and construction materials and services that are incorporated into certain exempt con construction contracts. And I'll, I'll go over in the next slide uh, a list of those exempt construction contracts. But the point here is if you're dealing with one of those exempt construction contracts, the materials and services incorporated into those contracts are going to be exempt under 573902B13. Next, we'll move down to revised code 573903B6, which states that a contractor claiming the exemption found in the one we were just talking about, revised code 573902B13, to claim that exemption, the contractor must obtain certification, which is the construction contract exemption certificate, from the contractee. And that certification is from the contractee is going to state that, yes, this is indeed a contract that's exempt um, under the list we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, also worth mentioning is revised code 573903C. Um, this, this section says that a contractor may obtain from the contractee a certification stating which portion of the contract is for real property and which portion is for tangible personal property. And so this is going to be important with dealing with a, a contract that calls for both real property and tangible personal property. It acts as a, a liability insulator for the contractor because the contractor is able to rely on that certification from the contractee um, as accurate and if it's inaccurate, the contractee is going to be held liable for tax on anything that was erroneously characterized. And so now here's the list I promised um, from the previous slide. Um, these exempt contracts mean that if, if the contractor is working on any of these uh, contracts listed, that the services and materials that they incorporate into these contracts are going to be exempt from tax under uh, the previous code that we just talked about, 5739-02-B13. Um, and you see the list there, realty on a government contract, realty to be accepted by, for ownership by a government agency on the completion of the contract, a house of public worship as defined in revised code 5739-02-B12, the original construction of a sports facility under revised code 307-696, and a hospital facility entitled to exemption under revised code 14008. There's more. We've continued that list onto the next slide. Um, also, horticultural structures or live sorry, livestock structures as defined in revised code 573901 for a person engaged in the business of horticulture or producing livestock. And then finally, real property in, a, in another state if the materials or services, when sold to a construction contractor in that state for incorporation into real property in that state, would be exempt from tax on sales levied in that state. Which is the long way of saying that if, say, you're working on a construction contract in Indiana and you buy material in Indiana and that material would have been free from tax in Indiana, the same purchase of that material in Ohio for incorporation into that contract in Indiana is also going to be tax-free. And again, these are all, the, the list from this slide and the previous slide are all um, exempt contracts that are, are going to be contracts that if you incorporate services and materials into, uh, the purchase of those materials and services are going to be exempt from tax. Um, it's also important to note that in Ohio Administrative Code 5703914H, that machinery, tools, equipment, and supplies used by the construction contractor to perform a contract are taxable to the contractor. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're dealing with a, an exempt contract or a, a regular contract, the machinery, tools, and equipment, supplies that the contractor uses are always going to be taxable to the contractor, as well as the repairs to those, uh, to those tools and equipment. Ohio Administrative Code 5703914 I and J also specify certain exemption certificate requirements. And Brian will talk about these in more in depth, and he'll give you an example of each of the different kinds of uh, certification forms. But it's important to talk about them now. 
Um, construction contract exemption certificates must be signed on official forms by both the contractee and the contractor. The contractor must make copies of the construction contract exemption certificate and if they're the prime contractor, also supply a copy to each of the subcontractors who is then required to sign. And then finally, contractors and subcontractors may also make exempt purchases using properly executed contractors exemption certificates. And like I said, Brian will talk about those in more detail in a little bit. So we've reached our last test your knowledge question. And I got to warn you, this one's a little bit tricky. So okay. be ready. I'm ready. You're on a roll. Let's see if you can do it. All right. Question, a professional soccer team in Columbus enters into a construction contract with a construction company to build a new stadium downtown. Which party will be considered the consumer required to pay tax? Huh, that is a little tricky. I think a sports stadium is kind of a, a unique situation for a contractor. Um, but given everything you kind of talked about, I would think the contractor would probably be responsible for paying the tax. Is that right? No, I got you. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's actually neither party. Neither. The new stadium is exempt um, as an exempt contract under the, the list in Ohio Administrative Code 5703914D, and therefore the contract to build the stadium is exempt from taxation under that original exemption uh, section that we talked about, okay. Revised Code 5739.02B13. At this point, we want to pause for our first code word. Uh, the code word is exemptions. I repeat, the code word is exemptions. And I think with that, I'll uh, hand it over to you, Brian. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, very informative. I do what I can. Okay, so Ryan kind of laid the groundwork uh, as far as the law, as far as construction contractors. Um, now we're going to kind of go into some more practical examples as a contractor and kind of discuss kind of everything he talked about in a little more detail and provide some examples. Uh, so generally, as Ryan said, a contractor does, does not collect sales tax from their customer on the performance of a real property construction contract. Uh, for real property jobs, the contractor is considered the consumer of the materials installed and must pay sales or use tax at the time the materials are purchased. So if you look on the screen here, uh, this is a typical real property construction contract for a home builder. Uh, if you're a contractor and you get hired to build a home for somebody, you're going to be paying tax on the materials because you're going to be considered the consumer. So if you look here, the, the roofing, the house wrap, the lumber, uh, the two by fours, anything going into that project, you're going to be taking care of the sales tax. Um, let's say you decide that you want to subcontract out part of that house. Uh, you, you hire a plumber to do the plumbing. You, you need an electrician. Uh, the electrician and the plumber is going to be the consumer on their end. So when they buy the piping, um, or if the HVAC guy buys the HVAC unit, they're going to be paying tax when they purchase it from their vendor. Um, and that's going to be another real property construction contract. So in this case, the contractor is always going to be responsible for the sales tax. Uh, you can't claim the resale exemption on a real property construction contract. Um, so right now, the housing market's pretty good. So let's say you build this home and you don't have a buyer and you put it on the market and you're asking 400000 when you make that sale, you don't need to collect sales tax from that customer because tax has already been paid into the material. Um, as Ryan said earlier, the real property construction contract is, is never a sale for sales tax purposes. So that's kind of a basic example that we can give for a real property. And that, that also applies to any repair to the home or installation after it's built. So if you need somebody to repair the gutters or something like that, you're the contractor, you're going to be paying tax on the materials. So let's say you are the contractor that built that home and the housing market tanked. And you're looking for work, so you, you expand your, your scope of work into um, maybe equipment repairs or refrigeration work. Um, 
then you're kind of talking a different situation with sales tax treatment. Uh, if, if you if you're repairing equipment, that's going to be a business fixture, and the treatment's completely different. So, if you're installing a business fixture, this becomes a taxable sale, and you as the contractor is re required to collect the tax. So, in order to do that, you would have to get a vendor's license, and you would have to remit that tax on behalf of the customer to the state on a periodic basis, which is typically uh, semi-annually or monthly, depending on on the volume of business that you do. Uh, and then as Ryan said earlier, a business fixture is any item that benefits the business conducted on the premises, not the realty. So if you look on the screen, this is a common example of a business fixture that most of you are probably see every day. Um, it is actually a sign special for the business. Uh, these signs are probably 50 or 100 feet tall. You see them driving down I-70 all the time. Something like that sign there is going to be treated as a business fixture for sales tax purposes. So you as the contractor, if you build that sign for the customer, for the gas station or the restaurant, you would have to collect tax on the total price of that contract and remit that tax on a vendor's license. So that's just an example we can give. We're going to talk about some more common examples uh, that we typically see uh, when we're auditing companies. So right here, we've kind of put together a list of some common business fixtures that we see. And then we have, on the right-hand side of the screen, we have some common examples of things that are treated as real property. So on the left, on, for business fixtures, business signage, which we looked at in the last screen of that, the highway sign, that's going to be a business fixture. Office cubicles, those are kind of temporary nature and only benefit the business conducted on the premises, so that would be a business fixture. Uh, gas station canopies, Ryan discussed the FP&E case where they determined those to be business fixtures. Those are the freestanding canopies that you, you pull underneath when you fill up, fill up your car for gas. It, um, those are going to be business fixtures. Walk-in coolers, uh, things Data server rooms are things that we're kind of seeing more, more recently. It's kind of with tech companies coming into Ohio, we're seeing a lot of construction on data server rooms. Uh, those, are, those rooms are actually specially built to house the, the servers. They have raised floors, uh, they have specialized cooling, specialized HVAC systems. Uh, a server room is going to be considered a business fixture. So if you're in the business of building a server room, you want to make sure you collect tax um, from your customer on on that contract. Uh, fuel storage tanks, this includes underground fuel tanks at gas stations, above ground tanks, anything that's specialized for the business. Uh, and one, one thing I'll point out, this, this is just an example of business fixture. This is a non-all-inclusive list. So this is, the list could go on. I mean, if it's special for the business, it's going to be a business fixture. So you really need to analyze and think about, is it common to a building? Or is it just there for, to serve the needs of that business? So on the right-hand side, these are common things that are going to be real property. We're going to be paying the tax as the contractor. So restrooms are common to buildings. Doors, windows, walls, flooring. Um, I got a notation on flooring because, as Ryan said earlier, Carpeting is never going to be a construction contract, so that's the exception on the flooring. But if you're installing vinyl flooring, tile flooring, wood, floor, wood flooring, that's going to be real property. The only exception, which is carved out in the law, is carpeting. Um, and that's always going to be considered a retail sale for sales tax purposes. Uh, next on the list is driveways, garage doors, uh, residential swimming pools, building roofs, gutters, you know, the list goes on. Uh, these are common to buildings. Uh, so these are all going to be examples of real property. So hopefully this will help you as a contractor kind of give you some guidance on what things are going to be business fixtures and what things are going to be real property. So we'll go on to the next slide. So, so as a contractor, before starting a job, it really, the burden really lays upon the contractor to determine if you're selling a business fixture or selling real property. Uh, and it, it's important to make this determination up front so you can 
so you can have the proper sales tax treatment. Uh, if, if you're a contractor and you kind of ignore this aspect and you're, you're really selling a business fixture and you don't collect the tax, um, you really open yourself up to a lot of exposure. Uh, if, if you go through an audit, you'd be subject to the taxes that weren't collected in addition to penalties and interest. So it's really important that the contractor doesn't ignore this aspect and, and takes the time to, to treat it correctly. So we'll kind of move on. Um, on the screen here, on the left-hand side, um, we're going to discuss how you treat the business fixture, and then on the right-hand side, we're, discuss, we're talking about real property. So if you're selling a business fixture, uh, the sale and installation of a business fixture is a retail sale. And I kind of highlighted retail sale because that means all retail sales are subject to sales tax. You need to collect tax. It's not going to be a construction contract. You know. Even though permanently attached, a business fixture is not deemed real property. So I know when I first started uh, working, if it's attached to a building, you kind of assume that it's real property. But for Ohio sales tax purposes, you don't want to make that assumption. They can be permanently attached and still be a business fixture. So the transaction is defined as the sale and installation of TPP, tangible personal property. The contractor would charge the sales tax on the total contract amount and then remit that on a periodic basis. So on, on co contrasting that, if you're doing real property, the incorporation of materials, the TPP, into the realty, such as the buildings, the walls, the paint, uh, the concrete parking lot, or could be asphalt, anything that benefits the realty, that's going to be a construction contractor, a construction contract and the contractor is the consumer of that TPP, and you would pay tax on the material. So we're just kind of comparing and contrasting uh, the two different scenarios here on the screen. So we'll move on to the next screen, which is some more comparison. So if you're doing a business fixture, all costs, including the cost of the material, labor, and markup, must be included in the taxable price. So for example, Back on a few screens ago, if you're installing that sign and the total contract is going to be $400,000, you have that $400,000 is going to be the taxable base, and you would need to collect tax at whatever county that's being installed at. Sales tax is calculated on the total cost of the business fixture sold. You, as the construction contractor, need to maintain a regular county vendor's license, or if you're a contractor located outside of Ohio, and then you're coming into Ohio to do work, which is quite common, you would need to obtain a seller's use tax account to remit that tax. For real property, since it's technically not a retail sale, according to the law, no tax needs to be collected from the customer. And that's probably going to be most, most, scenario, most scenarios for most contractors are going to be dealing with real property. Um, but it really depends on what type of business you are and what kind of work you're doing. So, for real property, the construction contractor must pay the sales tax on the material purchased and incorporated into real property. If the material vendor does not collect sales tax, the contractor must accrue the use tax and remit to the state on a consumer's use tax, or if you're a direct pay holder, you can remit it on direct pay permit. So basically what that's saying is if you know, if you're working on real property and you know it's taxable and for some reason the, the vendor doesn't collect tax, or if you buy something out of state, uh, you would need to get a consumer's use tax account and self-remit that tax. And that would avoid any, if you're under audit, that would avoid any potential liability or exposure that you have. So you want to make sure you stay on top of that. Uh, as a contractor, make sure your project managers and the people working on make it, doing the purchasing are aware of this and making sure that tax is properly paid to your vendors. So we've kind of talked about the differences, so now I kind of want to talk about uh, actually an example of a contractor doing a billing on a business fixture and doing a billing on real property. And so if you look at this example, I have two different contracts. One, the left, left hand side is a business fixture, the right hand side is real property. And we're assuming that all costs on this contract are the same, except the only difference is the scope of the work. Um, 
your material cost is 10000 and that's what you're going to bill your customer. Your labor cost is 5000 and then you, you have permit fees of 500 And then you may have markup as well, but I didn't include this in there. So your subtotal is 15500 So let's say that this contract is, is for a refrigerator repair or, or some, some type of equipment repair. That's going to be a business fixture. You, you need to collect tax at the correct county rate. In this example, we use 7.5%. I think that's the Franklin County rate. So if they're doing this in Franklin County, the sales tax you would need to collect from your customer is $1,162.50 for the total of $16,662.50. That would be an example of how you may bill for this contract. Now, let's take everything the same and let's say that this project or the contract that you got is for real property. Maybe you're repairing a door. Same, same thing, you got the material cost of $10,000. However, in this scenario, you're going to be paying the tax on that $10,000 as the contractor. So notice it's $10,750. That's 7.5% of the $10,000 cost. Or as opposed to a business fixture, the material cost, which I forgot to mention, you can purchase that material uh, tax exempt under the resale exemption. So that's why that would be less. And that's only for materials incorporated into the job. So you have your labor cost of 5000 your permit fees of 500 So the total contract that you're billing your customer is going to be $16,250. Since it's real property, you don't have to collect sales tax. So I just put that in there to illustrate the sales tax is zero. But in most cases, if you're the contractor, you probably don't even want to put that line in there. And you may just put real property, um, and then you just bill 16250 So I hope this kind of helps you explain the differences. And um, if you're doing both types of work, this kind of illustrates an, an example of a, a single billing. So we've talked about how to handle business fixtures, and we've talked about how to handle real property. Um, next, we're going to talk about, well, what if you have a mixed contract when you have elements of both? And when we say mixed contract, uh, we're talking about a mix between real property and a mix between a business fixture. Um, some examples that I can give you that are common, that we commonly see of a mixed contract would be that gas station. Uh, the canopy would be a business fixture, and maybe the store that you go in and pay, that, that would be real property. It's got restrooms, it's got walls, it's got the regular roof. Um, that that building is going to be common, so it can be used by other businesses should, should that business shutter. Um, another example of a mixed contract that we commonly see would be a restaurant. Uh, restaurants have a lot of specialized items installed. Um, that, that will be business fixtures. And then also has a lot of real property. You've got the restrooms, um, but you may have specialized lighting, specialized cabinetry, um, special, you know, the table when you walk up front, um, that's going to be special. They have pony walls that are half walls that are not common to buildings. Um, that could be a business fixture. You see here the display cases, something like that. That's not common to buildings. Uh, that's going to be a business fixture. So if you're doing a contract that has elements of both, uh, the Ohio law allows for what they call a contract decertification process. And what you're doing is, as the contractor, you're certifying what portion of the contract is a business fixture and what portion is real property. And every contract is different, but you want to get the certification process up front. Um, and as the contractor, what, what, what you would do is request this from the contractee. The contractee will issue a certification to the contractor as to which portion is real and which is personal. And as Ryan, Ryan said earlier, ORC, Ohio Revised Code 573903C, allows for this certification process. The determination will indicate if the contractor is the consumer of the materials or a vendor of personal property. So continuing on, it establishes the consumer of materials for the job. Um, 
It protects the contractor from sales or use tax liability if incorrect classification of real or personal property occurs. So I'm going to stress this is really important as a contractor. If you can get this certification, it protects you in an audit scenario if, um, if something's misclassified. If you don't do this certification, uh, you kind of open yourself you, to exposure. And if you do it incorrectly, you could be subject to back taxes, penalty, and interest on any misclassification. So for the form itself, there's actually no prescribed form that the department issues. As the contractor, you are kind of on your own to get the certific certification done. Um, there's a form that, that's commonly used that, that we see quite often that was as, um, created by a, the trade association. The Association of General Contractors actually created a form a while back, which is commonly seen today. So. If you're a member of that association, you may reach out to them to get a form that you can use, but the department will, will accept those forms. Um, another option, if you're a contractor, you can, you can get a, a letter signed by your contractees certifying what portion is TPP and what is a business fixture. Um, so if you're doing that gas station and you come to an agreement with your customer that 50% of that, that contract is a business fixture for the freestanding canopy, and 50% is for the building, for the retail store. Um, you can get a signed letter from them stating that, and that would protect you as the contractor of the classification should you be audited. So right here in the middle there, this is actually an excerpt of that, an excerpt from the contractee certification form. So on the left, uh, this is where you would list out items of real property, and then on the right, you can list out items of personal property. So what you're doing is, is breaking down that contract as what cost of it is, is a business fixture and what cost is real property. And this will help you determine what you need to collect tax on and what you need to pay tax on. It will determine if you're the vendor or if you're the consumer. So, so continuing on, for the business fixture portion, contractors should issue certificates of exemption to suppliers claiming resale as the basis for exemption. If you're a direct pay permit holder and you've certified some of its uh, business fixture, you should not accrue tax on the business fixture portion. Uh, contractors should charge sales tax on the total price of the business fixture portion, including the cost of materials, labor, and markup, unless the contractee provides an exemption certificate or direct pay number. So the next slide that we've kind of inserted here is a flow chart on on how you as the contractor should be treating the sales tax. So if you start at the top, you're the contractor. What you first need to do is ask yourself, what is being sold? Am I selling real property or am I selling TPP or business fixture? So if you kind of follow this flow chart, it's a good guide to help the contractor determine how they should handle the sales tax. So we'll kind of walk through this. So let's say you're doing real property We'll start on the left-hand side. If you're doing a real property construction contract, the next where it breaks out where it says sales and use, what that's saying is how do I treat the sale of the real property? And then the use side is how do I treat the purchasing of the materials, which is the use side. So if it's real property, on the sales side, there's no sales tax due because as, as we said earlier, a real property construction contract is never a retail sale for sales tax purposes you're done. You don't have to collect tax. On the purchase side, next you need to ask yourself, is your customer exempt or is the contractee exempt? If they are exempt, you as the contractor can purchase your materials tax-free. And that's only materials that are incorporated into the job. If they're not exempt, you owe tax on all the material purchased or produced at cost because you as the contractor is the consumer. So moving on to the right side. Uh, if you're a contractor and you make a sale of TPP, uh, if you look, follow the flow chart, 
the contractor is to charge sales tax on the total price as the date the contract is signed unless the contractee claims an exemption. So unless they're a government entity or, or, or a state agency or they have a, an exemption, uh, you want to collect tax. On the use side, which is the purchase side, so any materials that you purchase into the business fixture, the contractor can purchase the materials exempt from tax under the resale exception. So you want to make sure you're, if you're doing a business fixture that you get that exemption when you're buying the materials. You don't, you don't want to pay tax twice. So when you buy those materials from your vendor, you can issue a blanket or unit exemption form when claiming the exemption. So I kind of, we kind of put this in there. If you're a contractor, it's kind of a, it's a really good tool to help you uh, kind of understand the process because we know it can be complicated, um, and hopefully this will help you or help people out there in the webinar. Um, you can use this as a guide if you enter a contract. So we'll kind of move on to an, uh, a new topic here. We'll kind of go over some common exemptions. Ryan kind of talked about some earlier, went over the law, uh, where, where you can find in the law those exemptions. Um, but we'll kind of talk about them again. So some common jobs, if you're a contractor, that's going to be a tax-exempt job um, are jobs with the U.S. government, uh, the state of Ohio, or an Ohio political subdivision. So you know, if you're working, if you're doing a job for the post office, uh, the military or Wright-Patterson Wright Air Force Base or something for the federal government, that's going to be what we'd call an exempt job. Um, any state agency, ODOT is a large one that contractors routinely deal with if they're doing road work. Uh, ODOT's going to be tax exempt. Uh, Ohio political subdivisions, when, when we say political subdivision, you're really talking about your townships, your schools, school districts, public libraries, uh, things like that. Another exemption that's widely available is the horticulture and livestock structures. Uh, for example, a hog barn or a cattle, cattle farm or something like that that houses uh, cattle for sale or farm animals and it's being sold and it's being used in the business, there's going to be an exemption for that. So if you're a contractor and you're doing work for an agricultural customer, you may want to make sure, see to make sure that you're getting an exemption on those materials and check with your customer to make sure that they are exempt. Uh, House of Public Worship, you know, churches, religious education centers, uh, charities, and 501c3 organizations are tax exempt. Um, but you want to be careful on this. You want to make sure that the, your customer is a 501c3. Um, there are some charities that have a designation of a 501c4 or 501c5. Under Ohio law, those would not qualify. You just got to make sure it's a 501c3 organization. And then hospitals as well is a common one that is covered under the exemption for the material. So you as a contractor, uh, you want to make sure if you're doing something that could possibly be exempt that you're checking into it. Make sure you're not paying tax where you shouldn't be paying tax under your materials. So we'll kind of move on and talk a little bit about the exemption certificates uh, that are commonly seen or used by contractors. So the first form here is one that most of you have probably seen. It's the STEC-CC, which stands for Sales Tax Exemption Certificate Construction Contract. Uh, this exemption only applies to materials incorporating a job, and it must be signed by the contractee to be valid. So it's really easy to fill out. So if you're a, a contractor, it lists all the 10 exemptions uh, that are available. So all you got to do is have your customer check the box, or you check the box on which one's exempt, and then you would you would sign you would have your customer sign here at the bottom, and then you as the contractor would sign here. Uh, if you're if this is a large job and you have a lot of subcontract subcontractors on the job, they don't need to sign it at the initial signing of the contract. You can make copies of this and then distribute it to all your subcontractors at a later time, and they can sign it and then they can submit that to to their vendors when they make purchasing. So we just kind of talk about that. One thing that's really important that you it's properly filled out. So if you're under audit, this is one thing that the auditor is going to be checking to make sure all these things are properly completed. It's got to have the contractee's name, the location of the project, uh, the name of the project, the reason for exemption, and it has to be signed. So those are the five key points that should be going to make sure you have filled out. Uh, the next form that 
that's commonly seen is very similar to the last form. It's the STEC-CO. Um, as you'll see, it's really similar to the last one, except there's a few key differences. You'll notice on the bottom, there's only a signatory for one, one, one person. Uh, the last one had spots for four signatures, uh, the owner, the contractor, and the subcontractor. Well, if you're a contractor and you're having trouble, you didn't get it signed and you still need to purchase the materials exempt and you know that the contract's exempt, you can fill this out and you don't need to have your customer sign it and submit this to your customers. But one thing I'll say, um, it doesn't protect, if you're in an audit situation and you get audited, this form would not protect you in audit if you misclassify the job, if it's not truly a tax exempt job. So you wanna make sure that the job is tax exempt um, because this form would not protect the contractor. So Ryan, did you get all that? We got a, uh, a another test your knowledge question. So here we go. Uh, you're working on constructing a new building and your customer is tax exempt. Uh, what's the proper form that you should obtain and keep on file? All right. I don't think it's A because you didn't mention that one. I don't even know if that exists. I don't think it's B because it doesn't look like the other ones. And I think I'm gonna go with D, because that's the one you get from your contract D. The C is the one that you make yourself, that you fill out yourself. I'm gonna say the one you want from your, your customer is D. D, the SDEC D. Yes. Yes, you are correct. We just talked about it. So that's the form you wanna keep on file. And I'll say this, as a contractor, it's really a good practice um, to write the job number Somewhere on the form, this will help you if you're audited that they, the auditor can quickly reference your contract schedule as to the job is tax exempt or not. So this would be helpful. I don't think there's a spot on there. So we'll kind of move on to a new topic here. Next we're going to kind of quickly talk about the taxability of materials because it looks like we're kind of running short on time. Um, so normally a construction contractor normally must pay sales tax on all the materials incorporated into real property, which we've discussed at length here. Um, only if the customer is tax exempt may a contractor purchase materials tax exempt when working on real property. Uh, the exemption applies only to materials incorporated into the job. And I highlight, or I underlight in incorporated because it, the exemption doesn't apply to consumables. It only applies to like the lumber, the nails, the two by fours, anything that's gonna be transferred to the contractee at the end of the job. That's what the exemption is good for. So items used or consumed by a contractor are taxable per Ohio Administrative Code 570394014H, which we commonly refer to as consumable supplies. And I'll say the that these supplies are always taxable to the contractor even on exempt jobs. So these are, the consumable supplies are things that aren't transferred to the customer at the end of the job. Kind of like rentals, tools, uh, tape measures, things that are used on the job but not given to your customer uh, when the contract's completed. So we've got some, we've kind of listed here some examples of items that are used or consumed. So we have your tools, um, power tools, hand tools, tape measures, uh, heavy equipment, uh, bulldozers, excavators, large pieces like that are gonna be taxable to the contractor. Rentals, job trailers, uh, portable toilets, air compressors, uh, scaffolding. Uh, a, a big one that we see quite often that, that is dyed diesel fuel. Um, that's gonna be subject to sales tax as well. So you wanna make sure you're paying tax on your dyed diesel fuel if you're doing a lot of off-road work. So continuing on, sandpaper, cleaning supplies, uh, masking tape, uh, tarps, hard hats, safety glasses, generators, welding gases, propane, uh, temporary items. So uh, one, like temporary electric, if you're constructing something to hold the temporary ele electrical box, uh, those materials are gonna be taxable to you, the contractor. Uh, private security, if you're doing a job and you need to hire uh, security or if you need to uh, construct a security fence around the job, which we see quite often, that's going to be taxable to you, the contractors. That's going to be a rental of TPP. 
um, and it's consumed as part of the job. It's not entitled to an exemption, even if your customer is exempt. Uh, temporary employment, landscaping, snow removal, these are all taxable services. So I hope you were paying attention. It's moving pretty quickly, but we got a new, another tester knowledge question. So you are renting scaffolding that will only be used on an exempt job. Is the rental charge exempt from sales tax? Ryan, um, what do you think? So you're renting the scaffolding on an exempt job. I'm going to say, yeah, because you're renting the scaffolding, it's not going to be incorporated into the final product. So I'm going to say that uh, it is not exempt. Uh, correct. Uh, it would not be exempt. A, any purchase or rental of tools, equipment, or other supplies that are not incorporated into the real property are taxable to the contractor, regardless of whether the construction contract is taxable or exempt. So at this time, uh, we're going to go ahead and pause for our next code word. The code word is consume. So the final topic that we're going to talk about is licensing. What types of licensing uh, does a contractor need need to be need to have to be compliant with sales or sales and use tax. So we're just going to go over the common ones that if you're a contractor uh, that you need to have. So if you're if you're selling business fixtures, you want to make sure that you have a regular vendor's license. So this is for contractors located in Ohio and should use this license to remit and report tax collect on retail sales. Uh, a seller's use tax account, this one is specifically for out-of-state contractors making taxable sale, coming into the state of Ohio and making taxable sales on business fixtures. Um, the next one is a consumer's use tax account. Uh, if you're a contractor and you're, you're making large purchasing, you really want to have a consumer's use tax account. So you, this will give you a method to self-remit or re, to remit the tax to the state on any tax that wasn't uh, charged by your vendor. And then the fourth one is a direct pay permit. Now, this is a special authority granted it to certain businesses that allows them to self-remit the tax directly to the state. Um, this is really reserved for larger companies in Ohio. Uh, the larger contractors, the larger GCs will have a direct pay permit. And really, this is, this is because they're doing a lot of taxable and exempt jobs, and their work is really mixed. So they, the department allows them to have that direct pay permit to streamline their tax reporting. So Ryan, we got one last test your knowledge question. Oh, fast, yes. Uh, does a contractor that only performs work on real property need to have a vendor's license? I'm gonna say, well, they're okay. So they're only doing it. They're only performing work on real property. So I'm gonna say no, because they're not making any tangible property sales. You're correct. So if you're strictly doing real property work, you, there's no need for you to have a vendor's license. However, if you venture out and you start doing business fixtures, the moment you sell a business fixture, you'd need to go ahead and get registered and collect tax on that sale. Um, and then you can, you can apply for a vendor's license, I think, through your county auditor or through the ODT website. Um, so that, that pretty much wraps up our uh, session for today. Uh, this last slot, slide here um, kind of puts some additional, some areas where you can go to to get additional information. So uh, the code that Ryan talked about, OAC 5703914, that's the contractor rule. So everything in that rule deals with construction contractors. So if you have questions, the first place I would go is to the law. Um, we have the real property definitions, the sightings there. Um, I've listed some information releases. This is just a few information releases that I think would apply to contractors. And if you're a contractor, I encourage you to go out and read these. There's all kinds of topics. Um, and then I got the link there at the bottom where you can find, find those uh, information releases. So 
Um, looks like we don't have time for questions uh, this morning, um, but I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Ryan. Uh, we'd be glad to help you out and assist you. Um, if you have a question on a business fixture or real property, you know, make sure you get that answer up front. You don't want to do it on the back end and find out you did it wrong. So make sure you contact us or anyone at the department. We'd be glad to help you. Um, so with that, I think that concludes our presentation, and I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Leah. Thank you. At this time, we're going to go to our final break. Again, during the break, all audio and visual will be suspended. However, we ask that you stay logged in. We will return at 1050.